forgot to bring my flavivirus model last time for Alec Hirsch's lecture, but um, this is the one to one million scale printed version of Zika virus, although all of the other flaviviruses are really pretty similar. So people like come take a look at it here. It's, it, to me, it's pretty amazing that you have an enveloped virus, but has a structure which is consistent enough that you can actually get three-dimensional reconstructions of it. And so that's, that's here. And you can see, I think, I think you can see quite nicely the dimeric forms of the envelope protein uh, sitting on the outside. So we didn't have a chance last time to discuss our coronaviruses um, a little bit. We talked about right at the very end of lecture. This was, they're everywhere. It's not just polio, even that's what mostly people talk about. Certainly, poliovirus has been a long, excuse me, around for a very long time. Certainly, as far as Egyptian times, we're getting close to eradication, although, unfortunately, I was just reading an article, I think, in the Washington Post yesterday about the vaccinators who are getting shot in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but amazingly, they're still gung-ho about continuing to do it, which, as I say, these are the real heroes as far as I'm concerned. The actual structure, at least for these pico RNA viruses, again, lots of people call them pocornaviruses, uh, is pseudo equal 3, so just three different proteins set up into a equal 3 icosahedral symmetric structure. Um, they have these irises, so internal ribosome entry sites, which are the two-dimensional structures in the RNA. Of course, they're really three-dimensional. Um, that the initiation, translational initiation factors can bind to and then cause translation to start even in the absence of a cap, which kind of gets us down to our you know, VPG, the 3D polymerases. So VPG is that protein which serves as the primer for the polymerase that sits down at both the end of the genome when you're talking about negative strand, but also for the positive strand. And that's what provides the primer for the replication of your whole genome. But because you have a protein down to the end, that can't be recognized by the regular translation machinery. So that's why you have to have an iris in these cases. And most of those flaviviruses that Dr. Hirsch talked about as well also have these um, iris sequences um, in them. What happens when you get translation? It's almost always this massive polyprotein. In fact, for all picoRNA viruses, that's the case, I think, for all flaviviruses, too. Um, one really ginormous polypeptide, so one start codon, one stop codon, and that gets chopped up into smaller pieces by, in the case of the, the coronaviruses, the picoRNA viruses, it's always a viral protease. But for the flaviviruses, and Dr. Hirsch didn't talk about this too much, but there are also then some cellular proteases that are involved in chopping up the polyprotein in order to make sure that it's a active form and then all the different pieces. But of course, these proteases, since they're part of a pro pro polyprotein, excuse me, they still have to be active and activatable uh, when they're still present in the polyprotein. So they're active in those cases. Um, these are assembled together as basically pentamers, which look a lot like what happens with Phi 174 Those pentamers all come together, together with the genome. And then you have cleavage of that very last step in the assembly process, VP0, that then gives you a VP4 and a VP2. And then the host effects here mostly have to do with translational downregulation. So since they're all being translated from irises, then the virus doesn't need any cellular translation to be going on, so it uses its viral protease to actually chop up some of the normal initiation factors. So that leads to vast amounts of production of the viral proteins and very little anything else. How disease actually happens in these uh, picoRNA viruses is still, I think, rather unclear, particularly I think some of us talked about it afterwards, maybe during class, so what's that neurotropism? These are certainly even things like poliovirus, they're enteroviruses. So how does that then cause nervous system problems? And it's probably just a dead end. Um, the viruses actually aren't particularly good at replicating in neurons, just they end up there kind of by mistake. So I did want to briefly also review the flaviviruses. Gross oversimplification, but I like to think of flaviviruses as basically the picoRNA viruses with a membrane around the outside, 
um, that has these membrane proteins in it. Um, these, of course, were discovered through disease, and yellow fever was one of the very early ones of the diseases that much later were found to be caused by flaviviruses. You also have dengue, which is the you know, big, huge issue right now as far as flavivirus diseases. And very conveniently, anybody notice yesterday that the FDA actually approved the dengvaxia in the US? So um, the dengue vaccine, which has some issues, but um, it was approved then in the US as of yesterday. Um, the big problem that dengvaxia vaccine seems to have is if it's given to someone who hasn't been exposed to dengue before, then the next time that they expose, they can sometimes have this, um, what was uh, Dr. Hirsch calling it? You know, antibody mediated um, something or other. If I can't remember, of course, it won't be on an exam. But the basic idea is that if you get infected by a second one of the four different strains of dengue, then you have a much worse disease the second time around. Um, antibody dependent enhancement, that's what it is. See? With the way the strange way brains work. <laughs> and so antibody dependent enhancement, that's enhancement of disease if you've been exposed to one of the serotypes, but then get infected later with one of those second serotypes. Um, exactly how that works again is a little bit controversial, but that seems to be the problem with the Dengvaxia vaccine. And so what they're doing now is they're only approving it for kids who are over nine years old and those that have already been exposed to dengue. So they, in fact, do antibody tests, et cetera, to anyone who's actually going to get the vaccine, at least in the US. So that's how that's being, being used. Again, you know, structure, basic story here is that, again, it's a fecal RNA virus that's got um, a membrane around the outside. Um, particularly important in that membrane then are the envelope proteins, and that's how you get your entry. They go from a dimeric form and then flip into a trimeric form at low pH, and you get membrane fusion. Uh, the replication and assembly, so replication, um, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the picoRNA viruses, but um, Dr. Hirsch talked about this a lot more, is that the translation of that genome, again, they're positive strand RNA viruses, once they come inside the cell, those then are all going to be translated right at the endoplasmic reticulum. So some things get stuck into the membrane immediately, but it's always associated with the membrane, and replication is the same way also always associated with the membrane. And certainly in the case of the flaviviruses, it makes sense because you get a lot of membrane proteins that are associated with it for like the PORNA viruses, less so, but again, it's probably concentrating things. And we'll see for the coronaviruses today, very similar things are happening. You're also getting these membrane forms where you're actually getting replication that takes place. And one thing that I think you know, Dr. Hirsch explained really quite nicely was that potentially some of the reasons for replicating at membranes is just to protect that double-stranded RNA from the cellular defense mechanisms. Because if you have double-stranded RNA, which you're always going to have when you have any kind of RNA virus, you're going to form double-stranded RNA because that's your replication intermediate. Cells all have lots of innate immunity mechanisms for dealing with double-stranded RNA and trying to get rid of it. And so if you encapsulate that double-stranded RNA somewhere where defense me mechanisms can't see it, that's potentially a really good way to make sure that you can maintain your particular virus. So um, then, yeah, so innate immunity, again, a lot of that has to do with recognizing this double-stranded RNAs as being something which is bad. I'm not going to get all into the whole interferon response, et cetera. That's an immunology question, and those of you who have taken immunology know more about it than I do, so I won't get too much into that. Other than, of course, that you know, vaccines are absolutely wonderful. Yellow fever works extremely well. Um, that vaccine has been used for decades. Um, there are some issues. Somebody else talking to you about that after class. Um, there are some cases, about one in 300,000 people do end up with neurologic disease from taking the vaccine, which is why the US doesn't generally give everyone yellow fever vaccine. But if you're going to an endemic area, it's highly recommended. So, but it's not just something which is generally used. And again, I just mentioned the, the problem with dengvaxia. So do people have questions about this, the flavivirus lecture? Um, I posted the audio, so that should all be there, and I posted the, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. I'm having trouble lining all of them up with each other, so at least for the time being, it's just going to be the audio. We do have a video from last year where we talked about a lot of the same things. But yeah, David. Uh, 
a question about the envelope. I guess they're mm -hmm. more general about envelope size and general. But mm -hmm. the lip is on, on the hose, right? Like the, the lip and membrane, but then are, is it only viral proteins that are anywhere? Or I don't know if it's still covered or anything. Yeah, so the, the basic question is, you know, so hopefully it's being recorded, <laughs> is where do the lipids come from in envelope viruses, and then are there sometimes cellular proteins that get picked up in that? Um, the answer is certainly for things like these flaviviruses, there's almost no space for any kind of host membrane protein that are there. But in the case of the coronaviruses that we'll be talking about today, there's certainly some space in the membrane where you could have cellular proteins. As far as I know, there's no specific cellular proteins that get incorporated into membranes. And usually what seems to happen is the way that these um, end up budding out through membranes is you have an assembly of all of the viral proteins, which seem to exclude most of the cellular proteins. And that is where you're going to be ending up with your budding process happening. Um, but it's, it's certainly possible that there are cellular membrane proteins that are there. When we talk about retroviruses right at the end, there actually are a few things that are cellular proteins that do actually end up getting packaged in virions, but those are not membrane proteins, at least not to my knowledge. Okay, other questions on flaviviruses in Dr. Hirsch's lecture? Good, so I can ask you one, right? We can get our clickers to work this time. Um, so, start. Start, maybe? Will it start? No, it won't start. There we go. <clears throat> so dengue virus eh, is mostly transmitted by which of the following? Aedes mosquitoes, blood transfusions, IV drug use, Culex mosquitoes, or birds? think you can't see it yet but 90 ah it's this way around today see it's always be a little bit different <clears throat> so is mostly transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes blood transfusions drug use culex mosquitoes or birds uh, culex mosquitoes and birds transmit which flaviviral disease west nile uh, blood transfusion iv drug use which flaviviruses Hepatitis C, exactly. So that only leaves us with 80s mosquitoes, even if um, we didn't already know. And he did actually mention this in, I think, quite a lot of detail. So um, A is correct. <clears throat> okay, so coronaviruses, um, you may notice a pattern here. We're going from smaller viruses to bigger and bigger ones in each different section. So we started out with a really small phage, got to the big phage. We start with the small positive strand RNA viruses. We're going to get the big uh, <coughs> single strand positive strand RNA viruses. The largest of these are the coronaviruses. Um, they have the largest positive strand, actually the largest RNA virus genomes that we know of to date. So um, really pretty fascinating and kind of breaking some of the rules that we thought we knew about some of these viruses. Uh, mostly coronaviruses were known for causing certain amount of the common cold, but of course what causes most common colds? The rhinoviruses, exactly. Um, and then, again, basically very few people cared about coronaviruses, although there was certainly some veterinary disease, and some coronaviruses and veterinary disease are a, bit, a lot more of an issue. Um, and until, of course, SARS came along, and then everybody cared about coronaviruses. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that <clears throat> as we go, through, go along here. A couple of key concepts that we really haven't talked about, and again, sort of the idea here is that we're building literally and figuratively on kind of the things that we've talked about before. 
These viruses, most of them, but not all, um, have protease receptors, which seems at first glance to be kind of strange. Why bind to something on the outside of a cell which is going to chew up the virion? But if you think about metastable virions, it actually makes a lot of sense to bind to something which will then start to break down your virion. The whole idea of frame shifting, I don't really talk too much about frame shifting, but the frame shifting, which is where the ribosome shifts reading frame as it's translating, um, giving different proteins, turns out is used not only in the coronaviruses, but the retroviruses, a number of other viruses, which we won't be talking about. So this whole idea of having different amounts of protein and how do you get different amounts of protein, turns out that the frame shifting is one way that that happens. But these coronaviruses and the related viruses are really fascinating because they have these things called subgenomic RNAs, um, which are really important for making proteins, and particularly those proteins which you need large amounts of. So the idea here is really that we need lots of our structural proteins versus our non-structural proteins, and so that's one way to do that. And another concept that Dr. Hirsch briefly touched on, but we really haven't talked about in too much more detail, is the whole idea of a reservoir species. And this is really important when we're thinking about human disease in particular and a lot of the big, bad, nasty um, viral diseases, including things like SARS. And at the end, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about MERS as well. So standard kind of outline, you know, disease, where were these things originally found? A little bit about the structure, binding, and entry, but the, the big and interesting part, and new certainly as far as the viruses we've talked about so far, is this idea of subgenomic RNAs and making the RNAs from an RNA virus so that are not, not completely full length. So we'll spend most of our time talking about that. Translation, the big difference there is it's frame shifting, and then how these things are um, bound and released. So, where do coronaviruses come from? Originally, again, they were studied looking at relatively benign diseases, um, all of these human, coron um, excuse me, human coronaviruses causing pneumonia, um, and then a number of these veterinary diseases. Curiously enough, um, these are respiratory, whereas a lot of the veterinary ones are gastroenteritis. Um, the canine co um, coronavirus is uh, fecal oral transmitted, and so that's one of the reasons that um, it's one of the things that actually there's a pretty decent vaccine for. There's um, good vaccines for the canine coronaviruses, unfortunately for some of these other ones not. Um, there are two different major groups. There's actually more than that now. Um, group one and group two, this is just how they're binding to different cell types. We'll see the difference later on. Um, there are a few of group twos that are also causing these colds and pneumonia. There's even a hepatitis virus. This is a mouse hepatitis virus. So we've had hepatitis viruses so far that are picoRNA viruses, that are flaviviruses, and there's also some that are retroviruses, and yet alone coronavirus. So livers are a place where you end up with lots of viral disease. And then, of course, um, the one that everyone has gotten really excited about coronaviruses for, and all the people who have been working on these kinds of coronaviruses beforehand we're like, woohoo, we're actually going to get some funding um, so they could continue to study um, their, their particular coronaviruses. So this um, is, of course, what happened at that point. Some of us hopefully still remember this. It was a few years back now, um, about 15 years. But you know, SARS was going to kill us all. And it was spread all over the news and newspapers, um, et cetera. So <clears throat> what do people know about coronaviral diseases? before SARS, um, it was pretty minimal. Um, common colds, nobody really cared that much about them. Again, a lot of it had to do with these veterinary diseases, and people were studying that. Um, and then they were just these weird kind of diseases that were made by these viruses that didn't look like other viruses and had these really big genomes, which was interesting from a scientific point of view, but not really so much medically. And a lot of the work, and in fact, most of the stuff that's written up in this chapter really has to do with murine hepatitis virus, because that was a relatively easy virus to work with in the lab. So a lot of the stuff in terms of what's in the textbook is really about this. But then SARS came along, and I actually kind of think of this as kind of an epidemiological triumph, really. Um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, 
first reported in February of 2003, and they figured out that it was a virus a couple of months later, and then after that had the genome sequence, and were really able to um, control the disease quite rapidly. Um, there are a couple of caveats that we'll get back to a little bit later on. Um, but from February to March, there were you know, over a thousand cases, so it really blew up in sort of the typical um, part of the, <clears throat> the word. So what is SARS? Yeah. Severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, basically starts out with feeling crummy as if you have a cold, but progresses really rapidly. That's the whole you know, acute respiratory syndrome. Um, and what happens is you end up actually, your lungs completely fill up with liquid and you can't get enough oxygen. That's what happens in these, in these diseases. Um, there were overall um, almost 8,100 cases and about 700 deaths. So about 10% um, of the people who were diagnosed with SARS ended up um, actually not surviving, although it got much better over time. In the beginning, it was worse, and then it got much better. Uh, given all of that media attention, um, there are only eight cases and zero deaths in the US. Uh, partly because it actually got to the U.S. a little later than places like Canada. Um, so about 10% um, of people, again, in these cases, um, relative to the 50-plus percent that we'll talk about with Ebola and actually even later on with MERS um, as when we get there. Um, how do you get SARS? This is actually probably one of the reasons that it didn't spread that quickly, um, it does seem to be direct contact and aerosols. So somebody is sneezing in your vicinity, then that's how you can end up getting SARS. Um, and that's why uh, you call the people with the masks. Um, that seemed to help actually quite a lot. But also it was getting care and diagnosing the disease very rapidly. So as soon as the disease is diagnosed, then you can get the appropriate treatment. <clears throat> so that made a, a big difference. The question, of course, is where did it come from? It seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, the original cases that they found were in people who were associated with some of the live animal markets in China. Um, and the first thought was it was these civet cats. Um, these are the civet cats, which I think, I don't know, I'm sure some mammo any, many mammologists here. Um, I think they're neither related to cats nor much of anything else, uh, but <clears throat> are quite present in a lot of these live animal markets. Uh, the genome of the coronavirus that's found in the cats was actually practically identical to the one that was found in humans. And so everyone was like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's these cats. We get rid of the cats in the markets. We won't have any problems. But then people started to look a little bit further, and they found that there are a lot of bat coronaviruses. And in fact, we knew nothing about bat coronaviruses until SARS came along. Now we know a lot about bat coronaviruses, and particularly the horseshoe bat. And then we'll talk a little bit about this um, as a potential reservoir species um, a little bit later on. So 8,000 cases, um, 700 deaths, over 4,000 citations. So for every case, there are like two papers that were published um, on SARS, which I think is, is quite impressive. Uh, but just to give you an idea what the activity was, um, in 2002, there were 120 papers on coronaviruses that were published. And in 2003, there were 620. So just a huge increase. Um, and now to 4,000 papers. Um, there were 4,300 in last year, and then 4,410 this year. So even like 100 a year um, are still being published on SARS, even though um, there haven't been any cases of SARS since 2004. So it came up and was gone really, really quickly. Although even though there haven't been any SARS cases, um, SARS was declared what's called a select agent. Now, we haven't really talked, we'll talk more about this when we talk about some of the nasty diseases like smallpox, et cetera. There are multiple um, biosafety levels um, and um, risk levels, risk groups for different pathogens. Um, so risk group one, are the things that you could basically drink and you'd be perfectly happy with. Risk group two are things that you have to be a little bit careful about, including actually most of these flaviviruses. Um, risk group three are those that can cause nasty diseases. Risk group four are the ones that cause really, really nasty diseases. And the select agents are a small group of that risk group four organisms. 
Um, and the select agents are those that if you want to work on them, basically everyone in your lab, everyone that you work with, everyone in your institution, everybody you know, probably that's a little extreme, um, has to do background checks and everything else. So working with any of these things is extremely difficult. I think it's a little strange that we haven't had cases since 2004 and then nine years later they decided it's a select agent, but I'm not the person who makes these kinds of decisions. So let's um, revisit this whole idea of a reservoir species. And so this is a, a very important concept that Again, Dr. Hirsch um, covered a little bit before, and this will come up again and again, particularly when we talk about some of those, the negative strand of RNA viruses a little bit later on. So the idea of a reservoir species is sort of goes back to our whole thought about viruses and definitions of viruses in the first place. You know, viruses are dependent on a host, and in order to be able to replicate and be maintained in a population, you have to have this kind of hosts producing virions which infect a host and this whole idea of a cycle. If you kill off most of your hosts, um, it's not a really good way to be able to persist as a virus. And so you know, Lambda figured this out and just hangs out as a lysogen. Um, and as a Lambda lysogen, E. coli are perfectly happy. And so this is sort of the analogy to what's happening in a lysogen. Many viruses seem to just hang out in a host, don't cause them any kind of obvious disease, but are still replicating. And then in some cases, those then viruses will make a jump, as people call it, um, from one species to the next, and very often in that second species cause some pretty nasty disease. And that's exactly what seems to be happening with SARS, almost necessarily is happening with Marburg, with Ebola, and potentially a lot of the things that are causing nasty diseases in humans are being maintained in some non-human animal and in those cases they seem to be relatively fine. And a lot of people are now finally in my biased opinion, um, starting to look at some of these native potential reservoirs, and then why are they not causing disease in some of these animals, and why are they causing disease in humans? What's the difference between some of these things? And in the case of SARS, it does appear that um, the reservoir species for SARS is in some of these bats. And part of the reasoning for that is that if you just look in the Philippines, 50% um, of the bats um, have coronavirus RDRP. Um, and when you say in bats, mostly what that is is going through bat guano and amplifying whatever RNA you can find um, with reverse transcriptase PCR, and you see RDRP sequences. And you can then very closely align those to different coronaviruses. And as we'll see in just a second, um, turns out that there's a huge amount of diversity in coronaviruses in bats. Uh, don't seem to have any symptoms whatsoever, and it's not just in the Philippines. Another study was done, and these are just, by the way, are references if you want to look these up. Uh, in the U.S., about 20% of the samples that they tested were positive. And I have to be careful about this one because um, it was a relatively small sample that they looked at. So 20% um, of, I think, 30-odd bat samples, so it's distinctly possible that these, these numbers are pretty variable. But certainly there are um, bats that have coronaviruses that are associated with them, and again, seem to cause no disease whatsoever. So when you get all of these sequences, um, what do you do with them? If you're a good molecular biologist, you do phylogeny, um, where you take all the sequences, you line them up next to each other, you feed them into a computer program, and it spits you out this tree. Um, so how do you try and read some of these things. Um, basically, the length of each of these lines represents differences between, say, you know, these sequences here and a presumed sequence that you had back up here. So if you have practically no line here, like, for instance, you have in this case, SARS in human and SARS in civic cats, these guys are practically identical sequences relative to each other. So that's one way of looking at these. But then what you do is you look at groupings. And so these, all of these sequences here are grouped together um, under 
and in fact, the best way of looking at it is right here. Um, all of these sequences group together. And this 100 right here means that if you do this analysis, analysis, I should say, 100 times, you end up with all 100 having this branching pattern right here. On the other hand, if you do this analysis 100 times, 23% of the time, all of these guys will group together. And so anytime you see one of these bootstrap numbers or confidence numbers at any one of these axes, you immediately think to yourself, OK, if it's you know, under 50% or under 70% of the time, I wouldn't necessarily believe that. If it's above 70%, then that's usually figured as being a pretty good estimation of what the relationships are of these. And these are also supposed to represent a history of these different sequences. And so if you go back to here, this would be the common ancestor of all of these other different kinds of viruses and so on and so forth. And so the take home message here, really, at least as far as SARS is concerned, so SARS sequence was determined very quickly, found to be identical to the SARS sequence in these civet cats, but these were you know, not seeming to cause disease, and very few of the cats actually had any of these coronaviruses. On the other hand, all of these other sequences here are bat viruses, so it certainly looks as if there's a lot of diversity in these different coronaviruses. And there was this bat virus, again, the horseshoe bat virus, that's very closely related to these, not very much sequence difference, and it branches together with these guys all of the time. So highly likely that it was this bat virus that either went directly to the humans or ended up with the cats and those end up with the humans. Yeah? So when you're attaining a virus to give us a vaccine, running it through like bovine or like human genomes, what are the chances that it's going to be effective? Yeah, so there's a lot of studies that So I'm going to paraphrase your question, if I may, and <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, Anko. So um, basically, you know, all this attenuation happens. Um, and shouldn't it also be being attenuated by circulating in one of these reservoir species? So that's just sort of another way of thinking about it. Um, so the process of attenuation, uh, what you do is you take the virus from one particular individual and then reinfect with that exact virus um, some other individual. And usually this is actually causing disease in those cases. And what happens is you're kind of doing the selection for in that particular organism causing less and less disease. You start out causing disease and then less and less disease. So presumably in that evolutionary process, the disease is going down. Now, the next thing you have to do with that, however, is then test it in other organisms like humans or non-human primates, and see if you end up with something which is attenuated. What happens is when you try and do attenuation processes, at least this is what I've read, is that sometimes they're not attenuated at all. And those are the ones you throw out. Okay. So they're just <laughs> manually selecting, like, you are actually this one looks like a scary, let's give it a bit. Exactly. And so that's my understanding, is that what's happening there. And in this case, um, very often for these attenuations, I don't know if you remembered from when Hirsch was talking about the attenuation for yellow fever, multiple different kinds of organisms. So they had chicks, they had, um, I think, mice as well, and brains, and so lots of different things that they were <clears throat> passaging them through. Whereas, so they, they don't have that opportunity for the host then to evolve and the viruses to be co-evolving with them. And so the idea there is that the viruses are evolving faster than whatever virus-host interaction would be. Um, and so those are sort of, you know, the, it's hand-waving, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But um, that's sort of the idea, is that uh, these are, they're probably attenuated, and actually really clearly attenuated in bats, but not when they then get into humans. And again, this is why I think it's, these are people fortunately now are looking at this, is why. Why do you have bats be, um, and there's actually a really fun twiv about this, and if you listen to this week in virology, talking about differences in bats and bat immune systems uh, versus um, what we have in humans and human immune systems. Okay, so we're all happy about reservoirs and that kind of thing. This should now be really easy. Reservoir species four, SARS coronavirus is probably... Humans, bats, civet cats, rats, or mice. Let's start. Yeah. 
can't see this, sorry. Let's move this across. Everybody voted appropriately. I think I have everybody's um, clicker numbers now, so I should be able to upload them all. And give you all one guess what it was. Oh, come on, let's, let's show the results. There we are. Yes, it's the bats, as far as we can tell. And actually, again, really fascinating question about bat and bat immunology. Now, <clears throat> if you're trying to work with bats um, that are infected with these diseases that can cause you know 10% or higher percent mortality in humans um, actually having a facility where you grow bats and have them controlled in a lab is not straightforward at all <laughs> and so there are only a couple places in the world that are actually doing this yeah Christian yeah sure no sorry that's one too many and then I can hide this yeah. So I find it weird that the uh, range length of the civet cat is about the same as the human mm -hmm. range. Yeah. And so that that makes me think: Do we have like a correlation with people with range length in the human and how similar to five civet do you think what human species? Ah, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll again I'll I'll paraphrase your question if I may. <laughs> um, basically, do the civet cats get sick? Um, and is there any difference? Because the sequence here are basically identical to each other. And is, is it a sequence thing which is causing a difference in terms of disease, or is it a host thing? Is it a virus sequence, or is it a host? I think is the question. And if I remember correctly, and this was a while ago that I went back and looked at it, I think the cats were pretty sick too. Uh, but that's a guess. But what, what was, I think what was found, and again, I'd have to go back and look at this, um, were that the you know cats that were in the markets um, were infected, but those that weren't in the markets weren't, um, and so it seemed to have been something that was really proximal to getting this transmission happening. Um, but again, I don't remember all the details on that. I'm, I can send you all the references; you can check them out. <laughs> but but yeah, the, the the sequence there, and even the sequence here, uh, this distance um, to get back and look at this. Um, this table here, this bat SARS-CoV sequence is still very similar to these sequences, and these bats seem to be perfectly fine. So, at least in the case of the bats, there doesn't seem to be a, a really big, big issue there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's, they got 37 where these branch together. And the way that these treeing programs work, this is, it's, as this is a great point. It's what I prefer to do when I look at trees like this, if I were the reviewer of this paper, <laughs> I would say put a dot there. Because 37 means that 63% of the time they didn't branch together. But um, they're still branching together um, with some of these subsets. And so, yeah, no, I do not like this tree particularly, certainly for these deeper branches. Um, these ones are pretty good. Right, yeah, I, I can see why they, if it was getting to the 90s or 100s, yeah. it just seems like if you step back one that the clearly the subsets are missing. Yeah. There, that it's not so probably what's going on here and this is just thinking about my knowledge of phylogeny, which is limited at best, <laughs> um, is that it means that there's actually way more sequences that are there that we just don't know about. 
and very often if you add more sequences to these phylogenies, those things start to tighten up and you get better bootstraps. No, and I think I forget you could go and look in um, NCBI, the number of coronavirus sequences. It's probably in the numbers of thousands now. And so, and the other issue is when you try to do some of these phylogenies, the larger and larger they get, the longer and longer it takes to do these kinds of analyses. And so we've been doing some analyses in my lab of about 500 sequences that we'll hear about a little bit later on. And those take a week to run. So um, yeah, these, are, these take a little while. Okay, other questions on this stuff till we finally start to talk about the structure of these things <laughs> and how they replicate themselves? Okay, so if you just look at these virions, they don't look very nice and similar to each other. And that's why I don't have a nice model of coronaviruses, because they're pretty pleomorphic. They're, they're very <clears throat> um, different in terms of their structures. So the virions are not all the same at all. But what they do have are these spikes around the outside. And that's the crown. This is why the coronaviruses, so corona for crown. Um, enveloped viruses, um, inside the envelope, most of them have helical nucleocapsids. So instead of our you know, nice regular icosahedra, these seem to be packaged as helical nucleocapsids. And we'll see this is true for a lot of the um, other enveloped viruses a little bit later on. Quite why that is for the coronaviruses is not entirely clear. It is much clearer for some of the other ones. Um, a few of them have icosahedral capsids. So what are these made up of? Um, they've got these, the crowns. These are the spike protein. And so this spike protein, this should sound very familiar, is a trimeric protein. Um, it also has the fusion peptides, uh, where it's going to give you the fusion of the membrane of the coronavirus with a host membrane. Turns out this happens in a couple of different places. Some, but not all, coronaviruses, and when I say some viruses and the ones that people care about, turns out the SARS is one of those some, um, has a hemagglutinin esterase, also membrane protein, that has hemagglutination activity, a lot like flu. We talked about the hemagglutinin beforehand and neuraminidase activity, which chops off um, sialic acid. So it's helpful for release of the virus particle when it gets inside the cell. So again, some of these, and, and SARS in particular, has this AT protein. Um, the most common of these proteins, interestingly enough, is this protein called M, um, which is called membrane protein here, but is usually called matrix protein in most other envelope viruses. And so this is what provides the bridge between the nucleocapsid on the inside and all of the spike proteins, the envelope proteins. And getting back to your question, David, about um, when you have the, the host proteins sitting in the membranes, it really does seem to be these matrix proteins, which are holding everything together, and then the nucleocapsid comes and forms right there. And so it's kind of the, the glue or the adapter that you have between those membrane proteins and the nucleocapsid proteins. The nucleocapsid is not going to go anywhere in the membranes. It's going to just go where those, those matrices are. And so that actually turns out is the most um, common protein. So if you just purify coronavirus virions, that membrane protein or matrix protein um, is the most abundant of them. And people have shown really nicely it interacts with both nucleocapsid um, and spike protein. And nucleocapsid is just this um, nucleic acid binding protein against binding to this single-stranded RNA. And then in some cases, um, you have this envelope protein that may be involved in budding, but you can get rid of it. You don't actually need it. So not surprisingly, it's the spike proteins that are going to be interacting with receptors. And I mentioned this right at the beginning. These interact now, in most cases, with peptidases on the outside of the cell. And again, this is not surprising at all, because if you have a stable virion on the outside of the cell, one way to make it unstable is it binds to a protease, and that protease will break down part of the virion so that the genome can be released. So it makes a lot of sense. The actual names of these things are not important, that they are proteases, um, I think, is quite important, just again, because it's out one way that you can get inside the cell. Um, and one of the ways that group one and group two are different from each other, there's that sequence, and actually I kind of mentioned that before, if you look at that phylogeny, one of the things that actually did have 100% bootstrap was the group one versus group two uh, viruses, but also they interact with different receptors. 
those that have the HE protein in them are often also going to interact with sialic acid. And so hemagglutination, um, getting the red blood cells to bind to each other is almost always sialic acid. Sialic acid is present on particularly lung epithelia, and so that's how a lot of these things seem to be happening and binding to uh, these respiratory viruses getting inside the lungs. So one of the neat things about <clears throat> these spike proteins, and also partly because people were really excited about SARS, is that uh, high resolution structures have been determined for many of these. And this is actually, um, this is a paper by David Wiesler and his group from University of Washington. Um, they solved this structure of the trimeric S protein, and actually this is the part which is outside the membrane here, with these nice fusion peptides at the top here. Looking down at the top, the fusion peptides are sticking out. Um, they only get stuck out after you have proteolysis that takes place, and so that's how you end up getting the, the membrane fusion um, taking place um, with that. And actually, David was here a couple of years ago. Anybody hear his talk? I think it was probably before the time that most of you were here. I mean, he talked a lot about this, this structure when he was here. So <clears throat> you got the binding, um, releases membrane fusion, sometimes it's the plasma membrane, but also in endosomes. It depends from virus to virus. Then you get these ginormous RNAs, which get released inside the cytoplasm of the host. And these are the largest um, positive strand, single strand RNA viruses, and actually the largest RNA virus genomes known. Um, the only one I think the one that actually has a virus associated with it is, I should say, virion, is 31,000 bases. But recently, people have been doing metatranscriptomics. I don't know what metatranscriptomics is. Sequencing all the RNA in an organism. So when they did this, they thought they were going to get all the messenger RNAs, and they actually ended up with a bunch of virus sequences. And so they were looking in planaria, um, which are flatworms, and aplesia, which is a mollusk, and they were finding these uh, really humongous genomes, 41,000 bases in the flatworm and 35,000 bases in the mollusk. And basically what it means is there are lots of these things in all kinds of other places that we've never studied them. Who cares about viruses of flatworms? Uh, but you know, could tell us something about how these viruses work. The real surprise with these um, these things being so big is that RNA-dependent RNA polymerases don't have proofreading activity, and they're actually not very high fidelity. So people had actually made predictions that about 10,000 nucleotides was just about as big as you could make one of these RNA genomes and still have it be replicated and not every generation having so many mutations that they would no longer be functional. So the fact that these things actually do have these really big genomes have had people then revisit this whole idea that RNA-dependent RNA polymerases and reverse transcriptases, when we talk about retroviruses later, have very high mutation rates. So they do seem to have mutation, very high mutation rates, but there also seems to be some corrective activity um, which is happening with them. And quite how that works, I think, is kind of up in the air. So, you know, was RNA dependent RNA polymerases, RNA virus genomes? Why don't we have all of our genomes be RNA? Because in an RNA world, that was, you know, probably was. RNA was the genetic material and was the catalytic material. Why did we switch to DNA? Well, DNA works because it's more stable and you can, you know, have DNA polymerases at proofread, but we have RNA polymerases at proofread as well. So, why not? So <clears throat> that was just, it's just you know, fascinating kind of an aside thing. But if you look at the genome, now you look at the translation products, the potential translation products of the genome. Um, first is these have caps and tails, so regular poly tails, regular caps, uh, and big polyproteins, but not the whole thing. And so it turns out that you've got one set of polyproteins here, known as ORF1A, and another set of polyproteins right here, ORF1B, but they're in different reading frames. And just slightly offset from each other, and we'll see in just a second, yeah, it's all about the, the frame shifting process. But then all the structural um, proteins are down here at the 3' end. And they're all in separate open reading frames. So something 
weird is going on here in terms of the translation. And we'll get back to that and, and talk about it in a little more detail. So a couple of proteins. Unfortunately, the names here are ridiculous. I don't expect you to remember them. But some of the activities are really important. First one is, not surprising, it's a polyprotein. What happens with polyproteins? They get snipped up. What snips them up? Proteases. So there are multiple proteases, um, particularly these non-structural proteins, NSPs. Um, when, you, when we look at a lot of these things, that NS is going to be non-structural or NSP is non-structural. We already talked about the hemagglutinesterase spike envelope membrane and nucleocapsid proteins here. And then, just like you have in all of these other RNA viruses, you have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, probably this NSP12. And then, remember, we've got caps and tail structures. How do you get caps and tails, particularly cap structures, if you're replicating in the cytoplasm? Where do those come from? They're viral proteins, so viral methyltransferase proteins. These are what are involved in making caps. And so I forgot to talk about this the first time I talked about plant viruses, but then I corrected myself to go back and talk about the methyltransferases. So many of these things have um, RNA-modifying enzymes, methyltransferases, et cetera, um, exonucleases, et cetera, which are involved in modifying the RNA, because all of this is happening in the cytoplasm. You don't have access to all of the other RNA modification enzymes that you'd otherwise have in the nucleus. So all the RNA modification is happening, happening here. So getting these non-structural proteins, uh, they're, as I mentioned before, these guys are out of frame relative to each other. And what happens, there's a secondary structure in the RNA right at this junction between the two. And what happens is the ribosome basically gets a little confused and will step back a nucleotide and then continue to translate in the different reading frame. This doesn't happen all of the time. And what it means is you have less of these proteins here at the end than you do have of these proteins at the beginning. And that kind of tells you, as far as the non-structural proteins are concerned, that these proteins that are encoded down here, you need more of these than you need of these here. And particularly important are these proteases. So proteases, proteases, proteases. These things you need immediately. Again, not surprisingly, you're translating your big polyprotein. And those then need to be made to chop up the polyprotein into its smaller pieces. Once you've made these non-structural proteins, then you need to start to make genome. How are these genomes made? They're made on cytoplasmic vesicles. Again, probably mostly because it needs to protect that double-stranded RNA from getting degraded. How do you get these vesicles? Um, it appears that in a number of coronaviruses, what's happening is you have the autophagy process, which is basically cells eating themselves, and that eating themselves process ends up generating lots of internal vesicles inside the cell. Um, and the virus just seems to take advantage of that, use these for replication purposes. Um, as true for almost all of these positive strand RNA viruses, you make negative strand, but much, much more of your positive strand. And this is probably, again, just the same kind of thing as we saw way back when when we talked about those RNA phage, is that when you're translating and replicating, they're going in opposite directions. And so getting that negative strand is a lot harder. But as soon as you've got the negative strand, you're not translating in that direction anymore, so you can make a lot more of your positive strand. Don't ask me what the primer is for replication, because I don't know. Um, but I did want to really briefly, right at the end here, talk about how we're getting our structural proteins. So as I mentioned before, these are all separate open reading frames. This is no longer a polyprotein. Down here at the end, how are these being made? And the first hint in terms of how these were being made is that all of these, these are actually, when you purify RNA from infected cells, you have a bunch of these shorter RNAs, each of which has a cap on them. But they also have the same sequence that is present at the 5' end of the genome. So 
what's happening in terms of making these RNAs. And this, again, these are, our, these are your structural proteins. So this is what you need the most of. How does that happen? It turns out that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase starts out making negative strands at the end of the genome and copies until it gets to one of these so-called translational regulation sequences, or TRSs. And occasionally what will happen, at a certain frequency, what will happen is then the polymerase will fall off and then go over to the 5' end and copy this last little piece here. And this happens, again, at certain frequency. But what it means is you've got lots and lots of these really small ones and some longer ones, some longer ones, some longer ones. And those are what ends up getting translated and giving you much more of your structural proteins than of your full-length genome or of all of those non-structural proteins. So this idea of what's also called nested subgenomic RNAs, and we'll talk more about this with some of the other viruses, which actually do exactly the same thing. Um, these are getting you more RNAs for your structural proteins, more RNAs, you're going to get more translation, you're going to end up with more of those structural proteins. Once you have structural proteins, then you can assemble. Assembly here seems to happen actually very similar to the Plavi viruses that Dr. Hirsch was talking about. Um, you have formation of your membrane proteins together with the matrix, and then nucleocapsid. This buds into the Golgi, regular excretion process will end up getting this to the plasma membrane, and those are then released. I think I'll actually stop here and not talk about our recombinant coronaviruses, and we'll do a little, little MERS intro um, on Monday. Have a good weekend. should be really beautiful.